A thank you first to uh, Tim Lawton and Peter Bottomley for hosting this evening and to my colleagues who, you know, I've organised events, but, you know, suddenly I realised there's a whole extra layer of complexity when you have it uh, in Westminster. So thank you to my colleagues for all the work that's gone into uh, today. Uh, and I'd like to <coughs> welcome all of you. I'm, I'm particularly pleased uh, that tonight we've got um, four chairs of the Special Educational Consortium, which has been one of the big pieces of work that we've, um, be, we've been working on for 30 years, very nearly uh, my entire career at, at the Council for Disabled Children. So, um, uh, Brian Lamb, I think you're the, the earliest of the four chairs. Um, then I think Nikki Elliott, you, you're next. Um, Kate Fallon, only recently retired as chair, and Diana Robinson, our current chair. So thank you so much to all of you for being here this evening. And I do bring apologies from our original founding chair, Paul Ennals, uh, and Philippa Russell, because Paul, Philippa and I uh, really set up the Special Education Consortium together back in 1992, in anticipation of what was the 93 Act. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, for, for various reasons, they weren't able to make it uh, um, to tonight. But um, they sent good wishes and wanted to sort of feel that they were in the room uh, representing that founding team for SEC. But to colleagues from, um, uh, from the DfE, uh, from across the nation, from schools, from local authorities and services, you are so, so welcome. And it's really lovely to see you all tonight and family and friends. So sorry, just, <laughs> just, just remember we've got some, uh, some family here as well. So I think probably what brings us together um, tonight is, uh, is uh, that sort of sense of shared purpose, um, if you like, the sort of the commitment and, and for some sort of passion about securing the best possible outcomes for children, young people with SEN and disabilities. Um, but actually, you know, this is a massive treat for me. Well, correction, I thought it was a massive treat for me. <laughs> That's the event approached. I thought it was a really bad idea, Christy. I can't imagine why we ever thought of doing this. Um, but I actually, what, what I want to do is, I, I really want to probe some fairly fundamental questions about our education system, whether it really provides for all our children, whether it could in the future provide for all our children. And whilst I have in mind children with special educational needs and disabilities, I, I'm not proposing anything or advocating anything that wouldn't improve the system for all children. So. Okay, so there will be data. Um, there, there will be evidence. There, there will be some anecdotes. Um, I had a bit of a tussle with this because I was going to quote Michael Gove and say <laughs> the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, and then I, I, so I tracked back on this quote and I found the original quote was the plural of anecdote is data. Lindsay, you recognize, okay. So the discussion went thus. It was meant to suggest that data doesn't have an immaculate birth and that the anecdote can lead to the deeper research and then to data. So it was in effect, the good story should be considered a preliminary evidence, the start of a more serious inquiry. So I thought oh, that's a really good excuse for including quite a lot of anecdotes. I'm afraid that the, the depth of my ambition is not really uh, quite that uh, trigger for that serious inquiry, but it's more the sort of illustrative value when the data tells you something, the data and the patterns tell you something, um, how can we help how can that we can we use that to help to understand what the data is saying? Um, I just need to warn you that there are not many jokes. Um, <laughs> there were to begin with, there were quite a lot actually to begin with, but it ran for about three hours the last <laughs> So I, I, I tried out some of the jokes on my colleagues, and their stony silence by way of response <laughs> steered me in the direction of removing those as a first. Um, as a first step. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the, there are some other things. Uh, I think that is the last remnant of one of the dead jokes that should have got evicted. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, what's brown and sticky? A stick, yes, of course. So, yeah, it wasn't any good when I thought I really should have <laughs> removed that. Um, then I thought, well, never mind about taking out all the jokes. We'll have some really exciting 
visual PowerPoint slides. Dave Gorman has just been doing a, a, a tour, PowerPoint to the people, and it's comedy through PowerPoint slides. And that sounds like great. No jokes, but we're, um, unfortunately, it's not really worked out quite like that. The, the slides are not that exciting. I've tried to use some Im images, but they're really not that exciting either. So no jokes, no exciting PowerPoint slides. Um, a bit of history. Um, does anyone recall the time when the Michelin guides were only written in French? <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't think any of you were old enough. That's okay. So there will be un peu d'histoire, if you like, to illustrate some of the uh, some of these um, issues. Okay, so I think this is um, a little bit like the games our children used to play. You spend um, most of the time devising the rules of the game, and then by the time you actually start to play the game, it's supper time. And so you never. Actually, but actually, the game is setting up the rules in order to be able to play the game if you if you ever had time. But um, what I want to do is to dig around a little bit into the framework of the special educational needs legislation and to think about how we are doing when we come to look at the sort of some of the fundamentals of the uh, of the definition to start with but then some of the fundamental frameworks we've put in place and whether those are actually really working to the benefit of children young people with SCN and disabilities so we're going to start the, with the tides from the from the title and we're going to, um, I'm going to take you through, I'm really sorry about this, I'm going to take you through the definition of special educational needs. Um, because there's some really important points that are, are, are literally embedded into this definition. And, and the first thing I just need to say before we go anywhere is look at that little bit about children below compulsory school age. So when local authorities have said to us, we are retreating into our statutory duties, it's been quite important to remind them that actually in that definition is that bit about children below statutory school age having a special educational need if by the time they achieve compulsory school age they, um, they might have one and unless we did something in between. So actually it's that early, that's that statutory duty there to intervene early uh, and to make the difference before a child does get into school. Um, but it's, it's a twice relative definition here. We compare children in terms of their needs, a greater learning difficulty than other children of the same age. So comparison between child and child, but then we make a comparison between the provision that is made generally available. That special educational provision is something that is additional to or different from what's generally available. So we need to start examining what's generally available. And that's the reason I want to um, start with this because most of what I want to say actually is going to relate to provision, not to needs. So we rely on that individual matching of the child's needs to the provision that they need. And then we make a decision on the basis of the provision as to whether we need uh, any statutory intervention or not. Um, so yes, uh, as the generally available provision uh, diminishes, we need to do more individual intervention as the quality of that generally available uh, provision uh, increases, we need uh, less intervention. So um, Great British Seaside, um, the groin at the seaside and the tide coming in um, if you like that uh, provision and for these children here we need to make uh, additional or different provision for all of them. As the tide rises, we need to make less, um, intervention, less uh, in individual intervention, um, and if we have an even higher tide, then we need to intervene only for a few children. And, and it's quite important, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the tide could rise to the top and cover all those posts, um, because I'm not sure that we would want or need to make that really carefully tailored individual uh, provision for every child. But if we observe the quality of the provision reducing, or possibly the funding or the curriculum, as that provides for fewer children, we need to intervene more. And we could think about funding, we could think about curriculum, we could think about the services available to support schools and settings. So in this context, 
Um, I think, um, oh yes, the, sorry, missed out the seagulls. Um, <laughs> in this context, we, we can't really think of schools, settings, colleges on their own because they sit in a local context. So what schools and settings do on their own is supplemented by what services can provide and by that access to any kind of specialist support we might need for a small number of children. So um, that bit that I've called universal there, um, just accept for now that that is roughly what we think schools can do, schools and settings and colleges can do on their own without uh, that external intervention. And then the services can supplement, complement that. Um, but that bit of what I've called universal there is what we tend to call ordinarily available provision. I insist on calling it ordinarily available provision because the acronym OAP does not appeal to one who is rapidly facing the prospect of becoming one. So, um, so we, we talk about ordinarily available provision. I promise if you practice it enough, it really does trip off the tongue. Um, but yet yeah, this is not a sort of static thing, really. It's a dynamic thing. Those services working with schools, colleges, providing that training, advice and support, and also providing a sort of triage, a filter of children who may need to go through to more specialist provision. So remember this, I'll be testing on this slide later. Right, so what does the evidence tell us about the current height of the tide? And, you know, it is quite a bleak picture. You are so much more likely to get excluded from school if you have a special educational need, which is bizarre. Surely these are the children for whom we've carefully tailored a programme, and yet they are more likely to be out of school. They are more likely to be represented in those children who've been off-rolled. That is, those children who disappear from uh, their school just as you're heading up towards GCSE time. And uh, as the researchers said on this, uh, that can have a flattering impact on schools' results. They're more likely to be represented in those um, children who are now electively, electively home educated. Um, a significant increase, uh, an estimated uh, 58,000 children educated at home up 27% from uh, 2017, so that figure was 2019. So research tells us that the outcomes are not good for children who come out of school. Um, many of them are unlikely to return to school. Um, about four in 10 children who fall out of school do not return to the sc uh, school system ever again. You're also more likely to be absent from school if you have a special educational need. And further, there are likely to be difficulties in getting into school in the first place. A carefully worded title here, but the message that many parents receive as they arrive at school with their child with a special educational need or a disability is a quiet, it might be best if you looked elsewhere. Even that encouraging message that actually there's a very good SEN department down the road and the Senko there will really understand your child, it will get on very, very well with them. Mm -hmm. So um, that is, that is, um, that, that is a, a, a real problem. It, it is discrimination and it's, and it's happening. Uh, that report was 2014. We still get a lot of reports of that now. But perhaps the most shocking thing of all for me is this, uh, these exclusions of our youngest children. Those taller red bars are our five-year-olds in our schools. This is only schools data. We don't collect it from the um, preschool nurseries. So, um, in 2016-17, 7,000 five-year-olds were excluded. So, sorry, there were 7,000 exclusions of five-year-olds from school. I'll talk to you about the pupil numbers in a minute. There are also those smaller blue bars are the four-year-olds and under who are excluded from school. But if we wanted to do something about this, I think this is where we should start. That four-year-old biter will otherwise be on his way to a local special school by the time he's heading up towards secondary, he'd been in a remote residential special school and costing the public purse a most massive amount of money over probably quite significant part of his school career. 
And actually, it's really quite simple to solve these problems with the right support and insight at that young age. You can you can solve that lovely story from Cornwall about a, a biter who over two weeks was stopped biting. At the end of the first week, the staff were absolutely thrilled because he was only biting the staff. <laughs> end of the second week, mum was in, in tears. And you know, the, the settings manager was telling me this story. I said, what, what went wrong in the second week? She said, no, no, no. Mum was in, in tears because the first time ever she'd been able to take him out to the shops with the family. So it was just that, it, you know, at that age, with the right advice and support, that setting manager was so proud of the fact that they, you know, in two weeks, really, they, of course, it wasn't entirely licked, but it was the majority of it was licked. An increase in EHC plans is not a good thing in and of itself. Um, and that increase, I think, tells us that schools are struggling to cope with children. These are schools that have not been able to meet the needs in a way that's enabled them to engage in the school. And I think in that context, um, you know, we need to think about some of these other factors I referred to in the terms of the ties. We need to think about funding over that period has declined. We've had the introduction of a new curriculum in 2014, which is very, very content heavy, very difficult, particularly for primary school teachers to teach inclusively. So let's think a little bit about, and, and a very significant increase um, in um, the, both the numbers and the percentage there. So let, let's think about what, what, are the, what are the underlying issues and, and why are we not finding out what's happening, what's driving this? Um, and to, to the extent that I think we really need to ask the question whether our education system is actually for all our children. If so many children are not in it for so many reasons, and if in consequence outcomes for them are really not good, uh, then we should be uh, exploring, doing you know, serious research. What's generating all those exclusions? So I think the first place we need to look is whether we've got the right legislation in place. Uh, because it's about um, 50 years now since we brought all our children into the education system. Before 1970, children were deemed ineducable and they were provided for in hospitals, junior training centres and so forth. Um, the um, 1970 Act made, the, made local education authorities responsible for the education of all children. And not long after, we had the 1976 Act with, as it were, uh, a, a, a duty, that initial sort of presumption of needs being met in a, in a mainstream school, uh, then called an ordinary school. So section 10 of the 96 Act brought in that duty to provide for education of handicapped pupils in ordinary schools, subject to those conditions that, that are known and persist in our, um, in our legislation today. So how, how far have we got and what have we done since to try and um, change things. Well, the 81 Act followed not that long after, um, and uh, then we had um, successive rounds of, of, of legislation. Quite proud of the fact that it took the Education Reform Act in 1988 to get me out of my job at the time. I was working for the Inner London Education Authority. I think it's quite, that's quite a sort of significant bit of my CV, you know, the Education Reform Act removed her from her job. Um, <laughs> Uh, th then we had a, a round, uh, th this is where the Special Educational Consortium started, uh, came into uh, action and started trying to temper some of the things that were in the legislation to make them more um, susceptible to considerations of the, the range of children we expected to be in the education system. And then a, a few things, uh, Mila, where are you? You'll probably remember um, the, uh, <laughs> you'll remember the Nursery Education and Grant Maintained Schools Act where we first managed to agree that the um, SCN Code of Practice should apply to um, uh, early years settings as well as to schools. It had applied since um, the 93 Act um, to, to schools. So that was, um, that, that was quite a, an important achievement. This is mostly what SEC managed to introduce into some of these bits of legislation. Then the SCN and Disability Act was, was really important because it extended the disability discrimination legislation to include all aspects of education. Now, only um, uh, uh, the, the one or two more um, bits I'm going to throw in there, the, but the 2002 Education Act um, was important and, and memorable in the Special Education Consortium because 
Um, there was a proposal for, well, there is, uh, there was an introduction of a power to innovate. And in order to innovate, people could waive the legislation. So you could do, some, you, you know, do something interesting here, it would be innovative, but in order to do that, you might want to waive the legislation. So it secured a commitment in Hansard that if anyone was proposing to waive any bit of legislation in relation to SEN and disability, they had to come and consult the Special Educational Consortium. I thought it was quite nice. <laughs> it didn't get written into the law, unfortunately, but that was, that was, that was quite fun. So then the, the Equality Act, um, it is important um, because it, it updated some of the uh, judgments. In effect, it, it, it tried to restore the effects of the Disability Discrimination Act to the, the, what they were before case law determined they were other. And um, then the um, Children and Families Act, with the, I suppose, the main achievement of SEC there was probably the extension of the SEN duties to young offenders before, before uh, 2014. Um, duties around SEN and disability hadn't applied to young offenders. And if you look at the levels of speech language communication difficulties, uh, of a whole range of difficulties in, in young offender institutes, so that, was, that was quite important. And also a lot of work done to make sure that the duties in relation to young people 18 to 25 were properly implemented through the provisions in, in the code of practice. So uh, just it seems to me that Despite everyone's best intentions, actually what we've finished up with is a process whereby we now have tighter processes around children with special educational needs and disabilities. We've got legal duties, but actually I suspect we've just got better at the procedures, not actually the things we're going to do to help and support uh, children. So, I mean, important to think about what's running alongside the legislation because the legislation on its own is clearly not uh, bringing about the changes that we, that we want to see. So, if you go back to the Warnock Report, everyone thinks about the Warnock Report in, in, in relation to parents, but actually what Warnock was anticipating was that there would be a lot more children with special educational needs in mainstream schools. And she and her committee gave very serious thought to the implications of that for the system as a whole. So there's a lot in there about curriculum development, about the development of special support services, and so on and so on. And yet, there wasn't really that accompanying change made in terms of what schools would need to do then to accommodate uh, that uh, change. There was work going on, and Seamus Hegarty was one of the one of the authors. A lot of work in the uh, in the early 80s, mid 80s, um, but it was largely in um, uh, institutes of higher education and uh, not sure ever really got embedded in school in a significant and sustainable way. Of course, some schools out of a sense of moral commitment put, did fantastically well, but it never really got into the bloodstream, if you like. And, and rather bizarrely, the, the code of practice for schools um, which commissioned by the Disability Rights Commission, it had some little uh, examples played against the, the, the legislation um, in the um, in sender, the DDA as it applied to schools. And it was bizarre in doing sort of roadshows with the implementation of the code of practice. What was really, really noticeable was that lots of people come up afterwards and they say, really interesting what you said about that young child with autism. I didn't know that's a really good idea. So there's actually, this was kind of performing some kind of professional development function here. Um, and really we did not have any kind of really thoroughgoing, and that's in spite of lots of materials that were developed. Uh, oh, this is, uh, spans quite a period of time, but for instance, removing barriers to achievement, uh, the revised code of practice there, um, the inclusion development program, there's a lot of stuff there, but it's not written into the DNA of teacher training of the curriculum. And indeed, when, um, when I was in the uh, DfE as a professional advisor and worked with uh, Brian on the, uh, the LAM inquiry, we were very much focused, not so much on trying to change legislation to do better processing, uh, but actually uh, trying to do some other things that would really make things work better for children and families. So we were focused very much on outcomes. 
and I think, um, Brian, you can contradict me if I'm wrong, but there was a sort of conscious decision that actually legislation was not going to improve things, but, for example, ensuring that parent partnership services at the time, um, when, when I think you were actually um, give, giving birth to your, to, to your second child, Daisy, but um, parent partnership, making sure that they were fully trained in the legislation, so in a good position to provide that impartial advice that parents needed. And, and yes, and there were some other things that we did do, so ex extending the, um, uh, recommending the extension of the uh, duties in the Disability Discrimination Act to include uh, a number of the reasonable adjustments duties. But our focus is very much on outcomes and very much on better conversations with parents. Um, and um, so this, this stuff is, is still available, but the, in the early stages of the inquiry, I spent long nights in different parts of, of the UK, well, England, sorry, there's only parts of England, but listening to parents talking about being locked in battle with their local authority. Um, and most of the discussion about was about how many hours of support assistant time they were going to get. And when I started to ask them about what that support was going to achieve, they hadn't really thought and no one had discussed it with them. So when we sat there long into the night until on one occasion, you know, the meeting that was meant to finish at eight o'clock, had to sort of dash to get the last train home. But um, when we went round the room, those parents didn't actually want or need what they had got. And one parent said, well, actually, my son has got full-time support in school, but actually, if he doesn't learn to travel before he leaves school, he's not going to be able to get to job training, whatever, education, whatever. Another said, my son's got support in his maths lesson because he's struggling a bit with his maths, but actually I think he knows more than the support assistant who's working with him. And what he really needs is a bit of help from the specialist maths teacher. And another one said, actually, my child is okay because she's got a full-time support assistant in class, but. She's really struggling making friendships in, in the playground. She really needs some support at that state. So none of these parents had what they wanted and none of them had really been engaged in that discussion about outcomes. So that is very much what drove uh, our thinking here and that that discussion of outcomes needed to be had in that collaborative way with parents. Um, and a lot of the discussions with parents do become adversarial and somehow we have to change the way that we have that conversation. I can kind of still relate to this because I might look as I'm a very, very far removed from my first teaching experience, but I can still remember that first angry parent advancing across the playground towards me. And my, I remember thinking, she's going to ask for something I haven't got. Too high cost, too high specialist, too something. I'm not going to be able to get it. I went into motor mouth mode. And there is a risk that when we engage with parents, we think they are going to start ask for something that we can't provide, and therefore we tend to go into defensive motor mouth mode. So this structured conversation was intended to be something that would lead to a more collaborative approach, thinking about outcomes, thinking about future uh, for, for that particular child. Um, and uh, indeed it went to, um, achievement for all the, the charity where, it, where more work was done on that. This, this wasn't on its own, but it's one of the important features of, of, that, of the, the LAM inquiry recommendations. Okay, so some of this has had some effect, but it's not been far reaching enough. And I think we need to step down from the sort of big picture stuff and look at the experiences of children in school. And, um, there's a lot here that schools really struggle with and, and the, the, the all understandable reasons um, and, and particularly when we think about some of the pressures I've already referred to. But the, the first bit is actually managing difference and disability. So the legislation asks us to treat children differently because we make reasonable adjustments for them or we make special educational provision to something that is different or additional to what's made normally available. So if we, in that treating differently, do we so far remove them that we actually are doing them a, a disservice? So there are some real problems here, and there are some real problems with the perception that you know, fairness exists in the common application of policies and rules across the piece without exception. So there, there are some real challenges here. I want to illustrate it with um, 
of the healthy snack cases. This is a case that went to the tribunal really, really on um, in the early days of the, of the extension of the DDA to schools. So Hannah Godley um, has diabetes and she needed a sort of high calorie snack at break times when other kids were only allowed to have the apples, oranges, fruit, carrots, whatever. She was sent to sit outside the head teacher's office to have her high calorie snack. And the tribunal uh, found that that was discrimination. Um, and yeah, because what happened, you know, where do you go when you be naughty? You go to sit outside the head teacher's office. Um, but I think when you sort of step beyond that, she, obviously she was deprived of that opportunity to engage with her children, her, her peers in the playground. Um, but we also need to think about the adults involved with this. So if you're the playground supervisor, while Hannah is having biscuits and crisps in the playground, how do you explain that to your children? How do you explain that they have to have this healthy snack while she's allowed to have biscuits and crisps? Um, and I think, it, interestingly, I think children accept quite readily that Hannah has to have this for her to stay healthy, we have to have this for us to stay healthy. I think children at a young age can accept that kind of different treatment. I think adults find that much harder. It would seem to be unfair that we indulge, you know, where all the children would like to have that, wouldn't they? And uh, those attitudes harden as we grow up, I think, and they lose that flexibility in terms of understanding difference. And uh, as a young age, the world is a pretty rum place anyway, pretty peculiar. So if this is another thing, oh, you know, that's really interesting. You know, she has to, to, she has to have healthy snacks. I, you know, I have to have healthy snacks, she has to have biscuits. That's healthy for her. But I want to look a little bit more at some of the really solid evidence we've got about children's early progress. Um, these uh, three studies from the group based at um, LSE and the Institute of, Centre for Longitudinal Studies, sorry about all the acronyms there, Centre for Longitudinal Studies at the Institute of Education and the National Children's Bureau and CDC have been involved in, certainly in the uh, formative uh, stages of some of this research. And the, this is based on these big cohort studies, um, but this is a secondary analysis of data which is already in those studies. So, of course, the, um, uh, the, the uh, researchers found the usual associations between disability and disadvantage, disability bullying, later adverse health and social outcomes, disadvantage, learning, speech and language and behavior difficulties, all of those were there. But the new thing they brought to this analysis was an understanding that between the ages of three and five, children identified as having SCN and disabilities fall behind their peers, starting from the same prior attainment, matched for socioeconomic status, which can do these huge studies, and then reset the baseline again at five, and they fall behind again at the age of seven. So. The researchers were really saying, well, look, is that because of these poorer early experiences of school or are there other things at play here? Are there things about expectations that are playing? And in the, uh, in the teen years, when young people start to answer all these questions for themselves, um, they uh, specifically looked at future aspirations. And what they found was that um, children with special educational needs and disabilities, even when they had the same GCSE outcomes, had lower expectations of their future careers, the sort of income they would earn, and um, uh, and you know whether they would go, whether they're expecting to go to university or not, and it affected things uh, quite significantly. And that has been internalised. That's even where parents of those children still had high expectations for them. So quite significant impact from that. So thinking about this, I was thinking, well, so how does this play into the system? And, and what I did was I looked at a few um, quotes from, well, a recent Secretary of State for Education. Gosh, that gives you a lot of choice, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 10 in the last 12 years, gosh. Um, so, but this was really interesting. I chose this one because actually in the same speech, this Secretary of State had actually talked about ensuring that our education system stretches the most able and provided extra help and support to get the basics right for the children who were, in, in some other contexts, described as struggling with learning. And I thought, well, of course, that's quite significant. That's from a, you know, Secretary of State. That is quite a message. So when you stop and look at it, that's quite a strong message. But of course, if you look through some of the education press, some of the writing, we find similar expectations that actually 
we've got to make sure the most able students fulfill their potential because they're going to be the future leaders. And if we succeed, it will benefit not only the individuals, but our country as a whole. What about those children who might just get one GCSE and that might transform their chances of getting into employment instead of spending a lifetime on disability benefit? What about the child who perhaps through help and support is able then to live independently or in supported living? Um, why are we not stretching those kids, making sure they fulfill their potential? And it's quite a different thing when it comes to children who we see as struggling with learning. And I think we need to turn that on its head. We are struggling to make the learning accessible to them and think about it that way around instead. And I think there are other things here. I think we are sometimes reluctant to talk about the future with children, young people with SCN and disabilities because we're not sure what the future holds. But actually, if we stop and think we don't know, don't know what the future holds for any of us, do we? So how can we overcome that reluctance? How can we, how can we think about um, how we engage children and parents in thinking, talking about the future as part of our daily discourse, as we would like any kid who says, yeah, I want to be an astronaut. Oh, great, what would you have to do to be an astronaut? You know, why, do, why are we not engaging in that same way? The third study from this uh, team uh, looked at three of those big cohort studies and uh, identified the fact that the social isolation experienced by disabled adults had its roots in childhood identified disability. So there is quite a lot there um, to, to unpack. What, what, is that, what is it that's happening in those early years that are determining that social isolation? And I think we don't have to look very far to think about how that comes about. We look at the uh, bullying rates amongst children with special educational needs and disabilities. The MENCAP survey, nine in 10 people with a learning disability, had experienced bullying harassment in the past year. That is, you know, if that is what is more isolating than, than being bullied. We also, we require our disabled children, children with special educational needs to spend a lot more time with adults than with their peers, in comparison with their peers, in both mainstream and special schools. And there are examples in the research where staff are sometimes not encouraged children to do things that they could do, that they were capable of doing, um, but uh, children identifying that then as isolating them from uh, their classmates who then obviously see them as not being able to fend for themselves. Uh, and just it's a, a great privilege, I had the opportunity to spend um, half an hour just observing a child in a, a classroom um, in, in Portugal as part of the European project on early years education. And during that half an hour, watching those adult child and child-child interactions, I realized that the only connection for the disabled child was with the adult. The adult was also communicating with two other children who were working collaboratively with each other there. But the disabled child did not communicate with her peers. And because I later that afternoon, I met her mum, my Portuguese is rubbish, but fortunately her English wasn't too bad. But she was, she was in tears because she was so pleased that her child was included in that school. And yet you could see the seeds of that future potential for isolation in a way that was really um, deeply, deeply worrying. And we, we, we know from the DIS research, uh, not least, wonderful acronym for that, um, that we, we do allocate teaching assistance to children. We tend to isolate them from their peers, their teacher, the curriculum. So um, we're, we're not necessarily um, deploying our resources in a way that is really genuinely going to support more inclusive practices. And the, the original accusation about the DIS uh, research was that actually that wasn't picking up children who'd got, um, at, at the time, statements um, or, or plans now. So actually, surely, um, this didn't hold for children who got, uh, got so, well, the, the provision carefully set out in a, in a statement or now a plan. Um, but the follow-up work by the, by the same team, uh, Rob Webster's brought together now in a, in a, in a new book published this year, um, shows that very similar things are happening to children with uh, 
the primary research was largely with statements, children with statements, the secondary research was just the other side of 2014, so it was largely related to plans. But the same thing is happening, slightly different impact in uh, primary and in, in secondary. So we really need to think quite seriously about what is the diet that we are feeding to our children with SCN disabilities? How are we really engaging them in the learning process? And that there are other things that we can uh, observe, and this, this is where Pudding Lane comes into it, because in a class where uh, the others were engaged in thinking about why the fire of London had spread so fast, and uh, what were, you know what uh, happened subsequently to try and make sure that any future fires wouldn't spread so fast, the child with the learning difficulty was stuck in the corner of the classroom with a line drawing to colour in. Um, and thinking that maybe that observation was a bit of a one-off, I was really intrigued. Uh, a, a message um, coming round from um, Speech Language UK, correct name, Carol, <laughs> uh, formerly known as ICANN, um, uh, a parent on the front of this email message from Speech Language UK about her son's education slipping because he was removed as a classroom to draw because the classroom work was deemed too difficult for him. This is the kind of stuff that's got differentiation, a bad name. And it shouldn't be happening like that. We've got wonderful work from Judy Seber in the 90s about how to turn these big learning things that we want children and young people to get their heads around as part of, if you like, part of their heritage, if you like, um, she had some wonderful activities to engage children with severe learning difficulties in, uh, in the core curriculum considerations. So, um, is our education system for all our children? And I think at the moment there are very strong arguments, even where they are in schools, they are not getting included in the process of education. Now, the Green Paper has ambitions in that area and um, th th so it's important that the that it's saying something about this talks about inclusion inclusive schools more children having their needs met in their local mainstream school it, it doesn't set out any analysis of what's led to this decrease in inclusion and nor does it set out any practical proposals for making schools more inclusive so i've taken a little bit of time to think about what it would take and i need to get a bit of a move on um, so what would it take? Um, well, I've talked a little bit about curriculum. So what about curriculum redesign? Could we devise a curriculum that was more inclusive? Uh, again, I come back to that point I made right at the beginning. I'm not talking about depriving any child who is going to accelerate through the attainment stakes of, of that experience. Can we do something that is more inclusive? And that's to the broader benefit of more, a greater number of children. So. Let's think about what Ofsted expects a curriculum to be. They want it to be broad, meaningful, aspirational, building towards the next stage and ultimately towards adulthood. They want it to be carefully structured. They want it to be sequenced and building towards those specified endpoints. So I tend to, initially I was thinking about a ladder as that kind of progression, but actually it's much, much more complex than that. And I think a sort of complex climbing frame is probably, because children will find different routes through that. And those different climbing frames will be different shapes, different sizes. But if we take what happens at the end of key stage two, um, uh, this is 2019 data, I should have updated it for 2022, but it's about 65% um, of those children who go forward at the expected level into key stage three. So here we are, there they are all going through into the expected level on into the key stage three curriculum. And they'll probably be okay. They've probably got sufficient baseline skills there to engage with the key stage three curriculum. Right, 35%, that's more than a third of children who haven't reached that level. What's gonna to happen to them if they've not reached that expected level? With a heavy content curriculum, it really leaves individual schools and teachers having to construct steps in the early stages of key stage three towards that key stage three curriculum and that it seems to me is an indication that this is really not a curriculum for all children um, i think where children are likely to be less engaged in their learning they're more likely to be disruptive in the classroom and i think we need to think about 
how we can provide some kind of entitled curri entitlement curriculum and a progression curriculum that would be better meet the needs of all children. And in, in that context, because we've been doing some work on the um, preparing for our, from the earliest years review guide um, with, uh, with Matt MacArthur from uh, Frank Wise School, um, we've been thinking a lot about how we need, to, for children benefit, we need to take learning in school, take it outside the school doors into the community and prepare them better for the next stage, at each stage of their school career. And I think that is something that is inherently solid, good practice for all children. So I think if we think about the future of their lives as we stand at the minute, I think something that is more focused on problem solving, on apply using and applying learning in a wide range of different contexts is probably going to be better provision better preparation for all of our children young people and there, there are many people sort of starting to discuss this the uh, pearson school report earlier this year people saying actually we don't think we've got the right kind of preparation for our our children young people of today for, t for tomorrow's world so yes curriculum redesign maybe what about so empowering teachers and focusing on teaching? Uh, so it's interesting to me that um, a, a number of um, people have said that actually SEN has become quite a high priority for us. And this is uh, from the uh, National Governance Association. Um, SEN and disability for all sorts of reasons, some of them funding, some of them progress, have now got quite a high priority for SEN and disability. And the uh, National Education Union tells us that about 40% of teachers do not feel properly prepared to teach the range of children that they will encounter in their classrooms as they, uh, as they start their teaching career. So let's just think for a minute about what um, good teaching is. And there's a really excellent uh, meta-analysis of a, a series of studies on uh, children's progress in um, inclusive classrooms. And there the were quite a lot of ingredients in there, but two of the key ingredients for me were about the grasp of the curriculum, never mind what curriculum it is, but where your curriculum, it, breadth, depth, detail, is sufficient to understand where every single child in your class is within that curriculum, then you know where you're going to be taking them next. And that is one of the criteria that the researchers identified. So it was that detailed understanding of the curriculum, but that on its own was not sufficient. It is that ability then to reflect and review how children are progressing through that curriculum framework and to review that with others like-minded, the pedagogic community they talk about and uh, keeping under review your understanding of that curriculum framework because children might find different routes through it. And I know there's some research on maths learning where teachers have observed children they didn't think they could be able to do that because they didn't have a prior, something that was assumed to be a prior skill. Um, so here, we need to keep this constantly under review. And we need to think about what difference does a really good teacher make? Well, the suggestion from the research cited in The Importance of Teaching, um, another uh, reference to the Gove um, tenure in the Department for Education, this shows that the top quality teacher can make a difference of, of, of a number of years in terms of children's uh, progress. They reckoned uh, two years more progress uh, with a top teacher teaching uh, someone for, for three years. So who teaches children who struggle with their learning? Who teaches the children who are not going to get great attainment uh, in, in academic terms at the end of their school career? Well, we tend to delegate that to the least qualified teachers and very often to the teaching assistants which we talked about already. And with some of the research showing that pupils in mainstream schools with uh, what was then uh, SEN statements spent over a quarter of their time away from the mainstream class, the teacher and their peers compared with the average attaining pupils. So 
could we re-energize a discussion about teaching and learning? Um, okay, it's going to go back to the ordinarily available provision, keep practicing, um, to, and, and to this dynamic model that we've got. So I, I want just to sort of explain a little bit more about the model so that we, we got to that point before, but where those support services diminish or disappear, where that support to schools does not go in and sustain, maintain, supplement, complement what schools can do on their own, you then get a bigger group of children going through to the specialist who is now getting more children there queuing up at their door. If you then reduce the capacity of schools to deliver that level of provision, you get an even bigger queue at the door of the specialist. And that's exactly what we've got at the minute. We've got diminished specialist services available. We've got that diminishing capacity of schools to, um, uh, to respond to that wider range of needs that they need to be able to respond to. So what's exciting about the development of uh, ordinarily available provision, um, but it, it is, a, it is a, a legal requirement. Local authorities are required to set out what it is that school settings, post-16 providers, are expected to make available from the budget that they have. This is not asking them to do things that were beyond their budget to fund. That's when you go for an EHC needs assessment and a, a plan. But what is really, really interesting, that even in beleaguered times, with that diminished capacity of schools, we have had such exciting conversations about practice. What's working? What's, what's not working? Why this group, of this group of children is really responding to this? What needs to go into this? How are we going to describe it to make this ex explanation accessible? We've had really exciting conversations. Two um, early years, one um, in, um, uh, in an early years um, context, two settings managers. These are small businesses. <laughs> settings managers are running small businesses. They were meeting up with each other three or four times a year, and they confessed that at the end of this bit of development work we'd done with them, they were saying, do you know, it's funny, when we used to meet, we didn't really know what we were meant to be talking about. So um, anyway, that's all changed. Now we've done this, we all arrive, we're all talking about what children are doing and how we could adapt. And you get these really, really creative conversations going, which is really, really exciting. And uh, in the words of Portsmouth, Portsmouth had a very long standing um, articulation of the um, uh, ordinarily available provision, which is actually going into the third or fourth um, uh, reiteration uh, just as we speak. But they say it's changed the conversation, changed the conversation between parents and schools, parents and settings, between parents and local authorities, and between schools and local authorities. So the, the, there are things that we can do still, and they, they are creative, and they really are quite exciting. And it changes the conversation. But there are lots of other things we'd need to do. We would need to think about where all our specialist services have gone. We've lost um, early behavior expertise. We've lost people with um, visual impairment expertise. We've lost enough speech and language therapists that those who are left are only able to address the statutory end of the business, so not able to do that preventive early stuff. We've had a reduction in portage services, and we know that um, the educational psychology workforce is, is suffering from shortages of EPs, and with increased workloads, like speech language therapists, dominated by statutory work. The importance of this is, is, is really immense. Uh, and just to illustrate um, a wonderful meeting with um, a, a group of um, primary schools in, in Rochdale. Thank you, Rochdale. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, to, just to illustrate the, the extent of that support that could be received. One of the primary schools in the group of heads I met with was saying, we're talking about the service. It's a very good support service with a wide range of skills and expertise. And she was talking about six children, it's, a, it's a, in a very deprived area with a very high level in-year admissions. And the head was saying she put forward six children for an EHC needs assessment. So it's quite high, it was the autumn term last year. And the, um, the support service came to chew it all over with the school, with the teachers, with the staff. 
And at the end of that discussion, they agreed that three of the children should go forward for an EHC needs assessment and three of them could be supported in the school with the help and support from the service. It's just that neat 50% thing going on there that maybe it was really very, very obvious that if you can supplement, complement what schools can do with their own, we could make a better fist of it. So we really need a massive workforce plan to look at mandatory qualifications, educational psychology, speech and language therapy, health visitors, um, child and adolescent mental health services. Really, we need to get that together if we want to keep more of our children in mainstream schools and doing well and learning and succeeding. Then just a little bit about evidence, because honestly, um, my teaching career, so my, the first group of kids I taught had come through their infant experience on this. Anyone know what that is? <laughs> so you're showing your age, Carol. <laughs> um, so this is the initial teaching alphabet. No, it, it's quite it's quite good. Let me get, let me just give you an example there. Okay, educational lunacy or wisdom. Okay, well that's not bad. So the ice angel gave the owl a ring. Okay, so it is a more consistent relationship between shapes and sounds, and that's what it did. It was devised by by Pittman apparently. Um, so was it, was it indeed a, a, a great idea or, or a dismal failure? Well, it, in the end, of course, what happened was that the kids who learnt the ITA uh, easily went on and learned traditional orthography easily. Of course they did. The kids who'd struggled with ITA, as they, they found the world more and more confusing. OK, so it wasn't like it was when I was in the previous class. It's, it's all different out there. So how do I now learn this new system? Were you taught on the ITA region? No, you can't. I was <laughs> okay. So, uh, so that was my uh, my first day of teaching was was uh, rather plagued by trying to work out how you move children on from the ITA and tell them that actually the world really wasn't like that after all. Um, uh, that was along with the good advice from my uh, senior and and better at the time, who, as I went down from the staff room towards my first waiting class, she said, there's only one thing you've got to remember. Don't let the children take the reading books home with them. <laughs> <laughs> looked around, I don't think I even got as far as asking why. She said, no, the parents will try and teach them to read and they'll get it wrong. <laughs> so it took research to really convince uh, schools the, um, uh, the packed system in Hackney that Sheila Wolfendale evaluated to explain actually, no, it was really, really good if kids took the reading books home. And now you see the kids going home with their reading books in their little bags every day. Um, and yes, parents, you need to make this a really enjoyable experience. This is lovely time, cuddles, you can sit around and, and find out lovely things that are in books. Um, so, you know, where where is that evidence? And should we be feeding that growth of evidence right to the very front line? Should we be asking teachers themselves to use the evidence of their eyes and work out what's working? Or can we dictate from the center uh, what it is? Because if we dictate from the center, we will not be able to allow for the variation of every single child in the, in the room. Yes? <laughs> that's, that, that, I think that's very generous, actually, Christine. <laughs> Um, so, uh, it, you know, it, it was, um, oh, which bit was I on? <laughs> <laughs> lost, lost my place. Um, there you, none of you were listening, were you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell, what was well, the last verse I said? Oh, we take reading books. Yeah, so there we go. Um, we, all, we all see kids taking their reading books home now. Um, but. Should we not be pushing that gathering of evidence to teachers, supporting teachers and sharing the evidence in front of them, um, in front of their eyes? Um, uh, things like lesson study, which really encourage teachers to review how a child is learning in their lesson and then go, go back and think and replan and rethink. 
um, really it's a reflective practice that enables teachers to run. If we dictate from the center, this is what I would say, that if we dictate from the center, we cannot allow for that individual variation that we know everyone is going to encounter in their classroom. So I think, um, of course, it's important we have the research that informs us in a very general way, but we really need to think about how we're using, where we want to deploy that evidence and how we want to help teachers to use it. So what about the money? Um, I have to talk about money, Russell, okay. <laughs> so, well, uh, all I'm going to say really is that in times of reduced funding, it seems that children with um, SCN disabilities are the first casualties. They're the first who are told, we haven't got the funding for your child, we can't provide that support for your child any longer. And we've taken some care with uh, recent funding reforms, not the most recent funding reforms, but um, to make sure that we provide explanations for parents that can be distributed to schools as well. Don't say this stuff. Your responsibility is to all the children in your school. Um, <clears throat> but uh, each time the funding reduces, we get that increase in uh, requests for EHC needs assessment. And indeed that, that increase is the single biggest driver of increased costs is that increase in um, issuing of EHC plans. So the money thing, especially when we know that um, the, the money is not necessarily going to, uh, being used and deployed in a, in a way that is really effective, nonetheless, we need to hand over the responsibility um, to uh, thinking about money, how it is used in schools to improve children's learning, improve their outcomes. We need to really make sure that we are supporting schools in identifying better ways of making best use of the funding that is available. And given that we don't really know exactly how all that money is spent, it's really quite, that's really quite worrying. But I think there's something which is much more important than any of this it is about whether our overall purpose is to devise an education system which is accessible to all children, where all children feel they belong and are welcome. And at the moment, I don't believe that we have that. The research from the Alliance for Inclusive Education shows that they many children with uh, many disabled children children with special education they do not feel involved in their school and the evidence that children young people themselves gave to the education select committee suggests that in general their experience of school did not provide them with good preparation for adult life and indeed they found experiences of adult life uh, rather uh, diminished by the lack of ambition that they'd encountered through their school careers so where are our national messages on this? And those, are, those are not um, encouraging. We have, if we go back to 2011, we have a very strong message in that green paper uh, with a commitment to reverse the bias towards inclusion, a bias that many of us in working with schools had, had not ever observed. Um, we had observed the, the pressures, as I've described at the outset, uh, children being turned away from school, being um, excluded from schools and being absent from schools in a range of different ways. So we did not see a, re a bias towards inclusion that needed to be reversed, but that was the public message that went out there. Our schools are too inclusive, we need to reverse that bias. Now, the, the last public message about any of this was Damien Hines, 5th of July, 2018, where actually there's a slightly mealy-mouthed objection to the fact that so many children being off roll that is effectively an illegal exclusion. Uh, without a, a radical statement of what we do actually want to achieve. And, and for that, uh, I do think that the work of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education has really built all of their work upon a set of values. Look at their stuff on uh, leadership, uh, inclusive leadership is all imbued with values. Look at teacher training, all imbued with values. Look at their work on early years, imbued with those values about inclusive education systems. So, do we have 
education for all children? Could we have education for all children? If we did, we'd need more curious children asking why, why, why? We'd need to have more high tides with good quality provision for meeting the needs of all children. We'd need to have fewer pudding lanes, better engagement with those who can make our education system more inclusive, and with those who have clearly articulated responsibilities to all of our children in our schools, settings, colleges, and services. Thank you.